Hey guys, Mighty Gazelle here to talk about My Hero Academia Season 7, which debuts in just a few days. I'm extremely excited. Much like my Season 6 premiere content, I will be going through my 10 most anticipated moments of this season. Now, it's going to be some speculation because we don't know for sure how far the season will go. I'll tell you guys in a moment what my guess will be. But, uh, so many great things to look forward to in this season. Uh, so to preface this video, I will say, if you don't want spoilers, if you don't read the manga and you don't want to know what happens, don't watch this video. This video is mainly for people who read the manga or don't care about spoilers. They just want to hear someone talk about things to look forward to. Now, like I said, uh, we don't know for sure where this season will end content wise, but I have my own prediction. And instead of doing some of the math myself right now, I'm too lazy. Let's bring it back to my former self about a year and a half ago. Let him take it away. Season two covered 22 through 68 for a total of 46 chapters. Season three, 70 through 124, 54 chapters. Season four, 125 through 191 for a total of 66 chapters. Season five was 192 through 257 for 65 chapters. So my prediction for season six is we'll get 258 through 327 for a total of 69 to 70 chapters roughly. as you can see that was the math of sort of how many chapters each season covered and for the season six i was actually pretty close it was only one chapter off it covered 70 chapters total that brings me to this season this season i believe and this is really tough because there's a lot of places you could end the season i tried to pick a spot that felt like it was attainable but also made sense thematically. Uh, I think this season will cover up until chapter 410. Um, I won't talk about specifically how it ends right now, because we'll probably talk about it in this list, but that would mean this season would cover 81 chapters, which would be the most any season has ever covered. But the reason I think that is doable is because A, there's a lot of fights. Uh, B, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of chapters that were pretty short chapters. Uh, so they're, it's deceptive exactly how much they're covering. Um, but yeah, that I, after a lot of thought, that's how I think the season will end is chapter 410, pretty close to that ballpark. So keep that in mind. That's where I wrangled in all my predictions was within that time frame, from chapter 329 up until 410. So without further ado well actually one more thing before we dive on in it's worth mentioning this is just my own personal top 10 okay i know for sure there's gonna be a lot of moments in here that you guys wouldn't pick for yours or vice versa there's a lot of moments you would want in the top 10 and they're not mentioned here this is just an opinion uh we all like different things we all root for different things and yeah so without further ado now let us dive on in to my top 10 most anticipated moments of season seven. Before we begin the top 10, there's one moment that I want to briefly discuss that I feel like I'm going to get bombarded with in the comments, and that is the death of Bakugo. I won't spend too long on this, but I just want to say I'm not the biggest fan of fake out deaths. I'm using air quotations right now. I don't like having someone die just for a shock value and then bring them back almost immediately after. It's a trope that a lot of series have done before. Wasn't a fan of it in this one. There are some moments that really do hit home and they're great scenes in their own right, but in terms of moments that I'm actively looking forward to, this is not necessarily very high on my own list. So I just want to bring that up because I feel like a lot of people are going to mention in the comments, how do you not have the most popular character's death in your top 10 anticipated moments. Reason being, I'm not a fan of it happening in the first place. I actually don't mind that Edshot brought him back because I think the the way he applied his quirk is very cool. And I know they didn't really mention that before that he could do that, but it seems to be a very self-sacrificial thing. And I think that that alone is pretty impressive, but the death itself, not a fan of, that's just me. But yeah, I wanted to mention it before I get hundreds of comments down below, so yeah. At number 10, I have none other than the best girl, Mina, in her moment against Gigantomachia. 
For anyone who watches my videos, you should know at this point, I'm a big fan of Mina. I think she's a very underrated character and definitely among my favorites of the whole series. Now, that being said, I couldn't exactly put her moment much higher on this list because in the grand scheme of things, she's not the most impactful character in the overall plot, but I love this moment so much and for so many reasons, I had to at least put her at number 10. One of my biggest complaints about the first war was that afterward there was very little psychological impact regarding all the loss, devastation that was laid upon the country. And Mina, of all people, I love this. She is one of the few people who acknowledges the loss and the pain and the emotional scarring left from that disaster. And it comes to fruition in her moment against Gigantamachia. Here we have Gigantamachia, who has terrified her since she was in middle school, and of course she had a second encounter with him during the first war. He is breaking out of his cage, bearing down on Mount Lady. Who comes in to save the day? It's Mina, unleashing Acid Man Alma in an attack that is one of the very few canonically to ever even damage Gigantamachia. Truly an impressive feat on its own right. But while this is happening, you have the sludge villain from way back at the beginning of the series who is attempting to take control of Shinzo. And you have Kirishima, who, by the way, has a long history with Mina, which makes this moment even better in my eyes, trying desperately to get the sludge villain off of him. He's ineffective. His quirk simply is not doing the job. In comes Mina, pumps crazy amount of acid into the acid villain, and he gets off to Shinzo. He's like, I can't deal with acid. And during this moment, you get some awesome transformation from Mina. Her horns become straightened on her head. Uh, some of the white, uh, some of her eyes are actually becoming white. It's almost like the uh, black on her eyes is like a fuel gauge. And it starts to like go down because she's using, using so much acid. It's such a visually cool moment. I, I just can't get over how awesome this is. And it's at this moment that we get Mina expressing what's on her mind. She says she's tired of protecting those that she cares about. And here's an I quote from the official translation. I know all about fear because I'm weak. That weakness makes me want to form packs and get close with people as we get a montage of her various moments throughout the series, talking to friends and interacting with them, having a great time. And to end it all off, we get a moment that just makes my heart glow. I love this moment. I don't really ship My Hero Academia. But I am a huge fan of one in particular, that being Kira Mina. Kirish Kirishima and Mina have had a long history together, and it all kind of comes to a moment where Mina, she collapses from using too much acid. It takes a lot of hydration from her body to produce this acid. She collapses, Kirishima dashes over, grabs her before she falls, and Mina says, there, I paid you back. And Kirishima responds, you never owed me a thing. Don't you get it? You've always been my hero. And that, just to me, is some of the most satisfying payoff if you've been a fan of these two since their origin stories in middle school, how Mina dove in when Kirishima was frozen and he couldn't do anything out of fear. And then the second war, Mina, she dives in again, but she's traumatized by Gigantomachia. And who comes in at the moment? Kirishima, because she inspired him to act. And now you've come full circle where... Kirishima, not afraid to act anymore. He's trying to save Shinzo. But Mina steps up, not only stops Gigantamachia, the thing that's been fearing her ever since middle school, but she's also there with Kirishima. It's just so great. I, I love everything about this, and it had to be in my top 10. I wouldn't forgive myself if I didn't put this in the top 10. At number 9, I have the UA Trader Reveal. Now, this one, this one hurts. Uh... This one really, I when I see this animated, I'm going to be feeling all sorts of emotions because Class 1A, to me, is the heart of the series. Everything from where they started to the trials and tribulations they've gone through to where they are now, they, to me, just, I love watching their journey. And to see one of them be responsible for so many bad things that have happened to the class, like the summer camp attack the usj various events and for for it to be aoyama honestly there's just so many layers to this uh obviously this is one of the longest running 
theories and plot lines of the entire series to see it come to fruition in such a sad way where Deku catches him talking to his parents with Hagakure and Hagakure is a really big element in this too because late in the game I feel like Hagakure really develops a close relationship to Aoyama and it makes it all the more heartbreaking but the thing that gets me is when they have him in cuffs and all the classmates who have called him his friend for the entire series are just in shock, utter disbelief that he could possibly be working for the villains. Uh, so there's that part of it. But the other part of it is Aoyama himself. We find out the horrible nature of the fact that the reason his naval laser makes him so queasy and doesn't sit well with him, it's because it, he wasn't born with it. It was given to him by all for one, by his parents, who sort of agreed to this deal to put him on in exchange for getting, getting him a power. And just all of it, it's just so emotional and it ends up with Deku still not believing to give, like he doesn't, he refuses to give up on Aoyama. And he reaches out to him and says, you can still be a hero. It's great. Uh, Aoyama comes back into play later on in the war. He really helps out at various times and has great moments himself. But this traitor reveal arc, I love it. Uh, it's heartbreaking, but it's really well done. And yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be on the verge of tears, to be honest, during my reactions. So, you know, but that's number nine. At number eight, I have the arrival and assistance of Gentle and Lady Nagant. This moment, to me, really encapsulates the whole aura of the final act, where it's anyone who matters, anyone who was significant in the story of My Hero Academia, is here in some capacity to help aid in this story, and that makes it so fun, so gentle. One of the things that always kind of stuck in my mind back during the Tartarus Escape segment of the story was there was always one prison that no one escaped from. They mentioned it, and they didn't elaborate on it. And it always stuck in my head, like, why did no one escape from that prison? Well, it turns out that Gentle was the reason. He stopped every single prisoner from escaping on his own. And when the police show up, they ask him, what, why did you do this? Like, what, what do you want? And he says, I just want to be with La Brava. And, well, presumably he says after that he wants to help uh, the heroes. But help he does, because the UI building is falling out of the sky, and everyone's like, oh my god, what's gonna happen? And in comes Gentle, like an absolute badass, and he says, I'm here to help, boy. Like, he talks to Deku, and De Deku's like, Gentle! Uh, man, it's so, it's so cool. Like, I was so giddy watching this chapter. And not only does Gentle appear in this chapter, but at the very end, as Deku's fighting Shigaraki, a bullet comes flying out of nowhere and snipes his hand off. And everyone's like, oh, no way. And way of miles and miles away. I don't know how far this could have been, but very, very long distance. You have Lady Nagant on the top of her hospital, was still bandaged up because she's obviously not well, still just putting her body at risk, sniping him from a ridiculous distance away. And it's just so cool. Like, these two characters who really... I, I love for a lot of reasons, but they operate in that sort of gray area where they're not they're not evil, they're not necessarily the definition of good, but here they are helping Deku who really changed their lives and it's just it's just so cool and satisfying and I can't believe not only did they both come back in such an awesome way, but it was the same chapter. Oh, I just I love it. I love everything about this moment and I can't wait to see both of them shine. At number seven, we have Star versus Shigaraki, or Shigafo, however you want to put it. This is going to be the highlight spectacle of the beginning of the season. I can't believe that we're starting this season with this fight. To me, this fight still, to this day, might be the most creative and imaginative usage of quirks that the series has ever seen. Honestly, I won't spend too long talking about this one because, well, we're going to be seeing this very, very soon at the time of this recording in just a few days. So, but just to wrap it all up in a nice quick bow, uh, Star's power of New Order is so freaking cool. The fact that she can apply a rule to anything she touches and says the name of, 
it is it is remarkably badass and imaginative and the fact that she uses this against Shigaraki and actually keeps him on his toes it's it's awesome because you think the whole time like oh the only one who can match up against Shigaraki is Deku but no Star is one of the very few other individuals in this world of My Hero Academia that not only puts up a fight but nearly wins if Shigaraki wasn't having a crazy identity crisis she actually could have probably won um but the fact that she grabs nukes with her gigantic air form hand and slams them into him in the middle of the ocean, makes a gigantic laser beam spear. There's just so many great things about this uh, this fight. It, unfortunately, it does end with her demise, but not before she deals some lasting damage with having New Order revolt against other quirks. And it's just a it's just a blast. And the fact, like I said, we're starting the season off with this. I'm not gonna dwell on it too long, but. Yeah, that'd be crazy to not put this in my top 10 most anticipated moments. At number 6, we have All For One versus Everyone. Yes, you heard that correctly. All For One versus Everyone. Uh, basically, not literally everyone, but a large chunk of the heroes. So, in this battle, All For One is currently rewinding. Now, we'll talk about that moment farther down the list. Hint, hint. Uh, spoiler, I guess. All for One's going to have a lot of spots on this top 10. That's just sort of how it is. He steals the show, so to speak. Uh, but this is this is the moment that I want to talk about first. So, All for One's rewinding. And the geek in me, the, the inner nerd in me, was so excited to see this. Because we're getting Prime. Not only getting Prime All for One. But we're getting him at a, at a stage where he can unleash whatever quirks he want with no repercussions. So not only is he unleashing devastating attacks, but he's amping them up to a degree where it'll actually physically hurt his body, but he doesn't care because he's rewinding. So it's like, oh my god, yes, we get to see all for one what he's truly capable of. And he does some sick things, like gigantic balls of lasers and electricity and lightning. And uh, one, of the, one of the lightning attacks in particular just shreds his arm because it's that, that powerful. And he uses it to help fight back against Tokoyami, which, yeah, let's talk about some of the heroes here. We got Tokoyami, Mount Lady, Gigantomachia, uh, Anasa from uh, Shiketsu, just unleashing gigantic attacks on All for One. If you like giant kaiju battles and just spectacles of amazing quirks, you're going to love this freaking fight. Like, I, I could go on and on, but this really was just so cool. Tokoyami really lo was so great in this uh, all for one has this speech about being being the king of darkness or whatever. Like I I, I own the dark, and then Tokoyami has a great line of like saying uh, even darkness comes in a range of shades, so you don't get to speak of the dark. Uh, and we see a cute little panel of him like as a little kid with dark shadow in his bed. It, it's really adorable. Everything about this fight's great. Uh, so yeah, that goes right here on my list. At number five. I have the reveal of Gear Shift. Now, at this point in the story, everyone's waiting for it. Everyone wants to see what Deku's final quirk is going to be. And when they reveal Gear Shift, everyone lost their mind. Because not only is it really imaginative and a really cool power, but it's extremely OP. Uh, there's so many applications for this, but the two that really strike me are the power output and the be able to shake up your moves. So... When I say shake up your moves, there's a scene where Deku's flying at Shigaraki, and Shigaraki thinks, oh, okay, I, I'm just going to punch him when he gets within range of my punch. But and he swings and misses because Deku's flying at him, and he's able to stop his momentum due to gear shift. It lets you change the trajectory of any object that you want. Well, as long as I think, I think it's ones you touch or yourself. But basically, it lets Deku just completely change up how an opponent will think he'll move or operate. But then there's the power output. Deku has this crazy sequence where he basically does a destroy it smash, but it's almost like amplified times like five times its normal impact speed and damage. And it even says it can bend the reality, the bend the laws of reality. Like what the heck? That is, I can't even fathom how cool this is gonna look when it's animated. Everyone was losing their mind. I Normally I'm not the kind of guy who's like all, Oh, I love power-ups and crazy spectacles of just raw energy and power because that's I just that's just not really how I operate. I just like I like seeing fights with 
some just more of the emotion aspect, but this is just like, sit back, watch it roll, and just see Deku use this new quirk, this really fun, exciting new quirk on Shigaraki, and it's going to be so cool. I can't wait to see this animated. Pretty simple spot on my list, but yeah, that's just how it is. At number four, we have All for One Backstory. This was an absolute delight to see in the manga. This is something I never thought we'd get, but damn am I so happy Horikoshi graced us with this. So basically, this shows everything, All for One and Yoichi from the moment they were born, to the moment Yoichi died, to where All for One even died. Uh, everything that you could possibly want knowing about All for One and Yoichi, it basically covers. It shows All for One as a demonic, crazy kid who would just kill people in the streets by himself by stabbing through their bodies in crazy, gruesome scenes. It shows him and Yoichi's relationship. He was a he was an absolute asshole to Yoichi. Um, but it's just so fascinating to see their, their chemistry. And it shows All for One's rise to power as this dark demon lord. It shows the moment that Yoichi gets killed by him as he tries to flee with rebels. And to cap it all off, this... If anyone's been, like, know, knows knows me well enough, they'll know that I've been wanting to see All Might versus All for One round one. And it caps off this backstory by showing the killing blow that All Might lands on All for One. It is probably my favorite panel ever to grace the manga, and I can't believe we got it. I'm so happy. I still want to see the whole fight, so I'm kind of hoping maybe the anime will add a little bit to it. Um, but I just, I can't believe we got this incredibly dark yet gripping backstory. It's even implied that they were the first quirk users ever because the mom had a strange growth in her arm that disappeared when they were born. Um, so yeah, everything about this is just magnificent and I, I wish we got more, but Hey, we got about two and a half chapters worth of it. And if they do animate th that this season, which this is toward the end of the season, if it is, this is like chapter 400 and whatever. I can't wait. This is this is right up my alley. I love this stuff. So yeah, definitely deserves a spot on my list. At number three, I have Toga and Uraraka. I should preface this part by saying, for the majority of the series, I never really cared about Toga. And while I like Uraraka, Uraraka was never one of my favorite characters. I just thought, you know, she's a good character and she means a lot to the show. And I, I'm glad she's around. But neither one of these two characters really I had much interest in. And that's surprising because I have an interest in most of my Hero Academia characters. So as the war's progressing, when it got to the Toga and Uraraka plotline, I was just like, okay, well, let's just let's just get this over with, right? Like I, you know, I'm not gonna hate it, but I'm not gonna, you know, have a great time or whatever. I I kid you not, I was so surprised and honestly changed my my entire opinion about these two and their storyline. And even now I can't fully explain because it's just so surprising to me how much this changed my opinion of both of them. I never really understood Toga and what she wanted in her life. And I think that's sort of the point. Like, at least for me, like, she was misunderstood. Her entire life, people called her something that... And she, they basically forced her into the life of villainy where they, they told her, no, sucking blood is bad. Like, it, you're evil. And she's like, well, I, I just am what I am. I, I love what I love. I, I can't, it's not my fault. And here comes Uraraka, who also I never really understood what her whole goal and point was with Toga. But again, this magnificent arc they had just swept me, blindsided me on how great it was and how it made me see just exactly what was being set up. Uraraka was the exact person that Toga needed in her life. And throughout they have a they have a dramatic battle with the, with the flying in the sky and Uraraka gets a quirk awakening. Uh they they talk about 
just love and everything. And I, I, I used to mock that they would their whole plotline is about love, like it's that's whatever. But no, it was so much deeper than my immature self was making it. And I'm usually very straightforward and uh, I can able to dissect things in My Hero Academia really well. But this this is one I failed on up until the climactic moment here at the end. And that's why it surprised me so much. And the way it ends with Uraka bleeding out and Toga transforms into her and gives her her own blood. We still at this time don't know the fate of Toga. I personally lean to believe that she died doing this. But based on the imagery and everything, that's just how I feel. But man, like it real when it was done, I was I was dumbfounded. I was so surprised and so amazed at what I had just seen. Not just the story, but the visuals. This is some of the best visuals Horikoshi has ever brought to the paper. It is just spectacular and I really really hope that Bones even comes close to matching the the heart and soul that Horikoshi put into these pages because my god they're so good uh it's this moment was so good in fact it's my number three most anticipated moment like it's just amazing I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I did and yeah I can't wait this is gonna be toward the end of the season as well but yeah it's gonna be a good one at the number two spot I have Endeavor versus All for One. Man, I could go on and on about how cool this interaction was and the fight and everything, but I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. Endeavor, to me, has had the best character arc of the entire series. Uh, I know he's still a polarizing figure, but to see it culminate in this moment where he's actually fighting his own... like. Remember, Endeavor was jealous of All Might almost the entire existence of his character. And here he is facing down against the man that All Might had to take down himself, but he's still around. He's got to finish the job. And you have All for One just talking all this mad shit, saying like, oh, you never found Toya's body, did you? Just poking at him. He knows how to press buttons on people. And then you get an enraged Endeavor and quickly sort of pays for that he, he he gets hit in the gut and you're thinking oh no it's not going well for endeavor but then he regains himself he remembers almost like all might he remembers his origin he remembers where he's trying to aspire to end up as a hero and as a person and he jumps right back into action he still he loses an arm right back when he comes back in and all of a sudden you just see an enraged powerful endeavor who's striking the ever-loving fear of God into all for one uh, who's you can actually see is actually terrified during this this segment he's like no please stop don't like it, it's it's amazing you have all for one who's always so calm and collected usually but no he he's actually afraid of all for one or afraid of endeavor and for good reason endeavor he shoots lasers out of his eyes that like they're like fire lasers like, I, I when I saw that panel I'm like there's no way that is so cool so the fight the fight by itself would warrant a spot on this list. But the reason it's number two is how it ends. So Endeavor roasts all for one, and everyone's like, okay, that's it. We, we killed him. He can't he doesn't have regeneration, we know that. But the biggest twist, one of the one of the greatest twists of the entire series, and I, I still can't get over how amazed I was when this happened. You see all for one begin to rewind and this would set up some of the most important and amazing parts of the final arc you have all for one rewinding and the second i saw this i'm like no way there's no way his ears are coming back his, his face his eyes are coming back what does this mean it means we're gonna see prime all for one and what he's capable of and i talked about that earlier on my list but this moment was so spectacular to me i i can't get over just how how fun the, the my mind raced with uh, possibilities of what could happen. Uh, just everything from Endeavor fighting all for one, bringing him down to using this last trick card. It's it's so cool. I, I, I can't wait to see this. And I'm going to freak out again, I'm sure. But this was my number two spot for sure. It's great. And it's only beat out by one spectacular, amazing thing. At number one, 
I have All Might versus All for One. All Might is by far my favorite character in this entire series. And to see him get one last triumphant badass moment alone is cool. And I would probably put him at number one. But it's the situation that we find him in that really elevates this to be my favorite fight of the entire series. Yes, I, I will stake a claim on that. It's my favorite fight in the entire series. You have All Might, quirkless, old and frail, the last line of defense between All For One reaching Deku and Shigaraki, and you have Sukaichi shouting, don't do this All Might, don't throw your life away. And we're getting flashbacks of Nidai saying, you'll die, like, a, you'll face a gruesome death of, of, by the hands of a villain. And you have All Might just like, ready, one last time to fight against his arch nemesis. And one of the, there's so many elements to this that I love, but I'll try to be brief, because otherwise I could be here for another 30 minutes talking about this fight. You have All For One, who's rewinding. And at this point, he even says it himself, he's getting more and more strong urges as he gets younger. It's, it's an influence of Shikaraki and just youth in general. And you have All Might down below, who he could easily fly over and ignore All Might, without question. He even says, like, it's, a cl it's clear what you're trying to do. You're trying to distract me. You're trying to delay me from my goal. And then you have All Might sitting down there just with a big-ass grin on his face. After, by the way, I'm bearing the lead here. He puts on the Iron Might, All Might, just mech suit, basically like Iron Man. And he looks completely badass. And he has his grin on his face. He thinks to his master saying, Gotta show my mug, right? Gotta have my smile. And that's the bait at the end of the hook. That's like, come on, All for One, come on. I know you want this, come on. You, you, you're gonna come down here and beat me? You're gonna fly away like a coward. And all for one even says, like, I know what you're trying to do. And then he just looks at his grin, and he's like, what are you smiling about? And then, boom, we get right off into this fight. Everything about it, I, I'm, a, I'm a history buff when it comes to My Hero Academia. I'm a geek when it comes to the lore of My Hero Academia. And the mysticism around All Might versus All for One, like, to me, I, it, it spans generations, first of all. It's, it's so ingrained into the foundation of My Hero Academia as a series. But just seeing All Might do everything he can to fight against this impossible threat, that rewinding All for One, who whatever damage you do to him will get undone. And you're in a suit that's gonna get slowly worn out over time. And there's, and there's no chance really that you'll win. But All Might not only puts up a good fight, he does it in a style that I just, it makes me, Fawn for the man even more. So basically, every one of his moves, every single one, is named after and dedicated to one of the students of class 1A. Not one single student is left out. You have to think, All Might put a fortune into making this suit. It is the most high-tech suit the world's probably ever seen. And yet, he took the time to design and plan for a move based on each of his students. And something about that, just honoring them in this final fight of his and believing that their their abilities will help carry him to success is so cool. And as his suit's getting worn out, you see All Might get beat up and he starts to think back to his time with Deku. And we get the shot, the first shot of the whole series where it's the street where Deku's looking up and he says, oh, look, a giant villain. And it's, it's Kamui Woods fighting against that giant shark villain. It's the same street the emotional callbacks and nostalgia, everything about it, it's just unbelievably well done. And then you have All Might, who's again, very beat up at this point. He says, <laughs> he says, to be of service to others, what a joy. And he shouts, and he starts laughing in the face of possible death. It's just everything about All Might I love, everything about this last fight of his I love. And I just, I just can't get over it. This is by far, far and away, like, Number two, I'm looking forward to, but this was always going to be in my number one most anticipated moment. I really hope we get it this season, and yeah, I just, I, I wonder I wonder if you guys feel the same way as I do. I just, you can hear it in my voice. I could go on and on about this fight, but I want to keep it as brief as I can. This stuff is legendary. I can't wait. I love all my, I love this fight. Yeah, number one. And there we have it. That's my top ten most anticipated moments of season seven. Uh, as you guys can see, I... 
you know, pretty diverse. A lot of all for one, which I'm sure is going to annoy a lot of people. Um, but he's just a big part of this final act, and I find him very entertaining. I think he's a really good character. I hate him. Like, I want him dead. But, you know, like, that's kind of the main point of, a, of an evil dude. Um, but, yeah, overall, just I can't wait for the season. The things we've seen so far, the trailers, the pictures, everything, to me, screams high quality. They really care, and I think we're going to have a great time. Leave your guys' thoughts down below. What are your most anticipated moments of the season? And how did I do on my list? Did you disagree with a lot of my stuff? Let me know. Until, well, I guess just subscribe if you want, because I'll be doing reactions to every single episode as I come up. I still do the reactions to the manga, which is nearing its end. But, uh, you know, I'm still loving doing those. So, yeah. Until next time, it's been Mighty Gazelle. Hoping you all have a mighty day. See you guys.